Monday Night Rugby on Off The Ball with Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. Team of us, everyone in. Colin on the charge, up to a yard short, here come Leinster again. Poised to score the first try of the afternoon. Jerome Garces raises his arm and Leinster have the first try of the final. And it's been coming. The man advantage perhaps pays dividends. It's the defending champions who have the first try of the afternoon. And they have opened up a lead, 32 minutes in. It's got the nothing here. Real potential. Oh, that's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant from Farrell. He shipped it on to Maitland. And Saracens have their try. Oh, Vinopola breaks away. He's going all the way for the line. Oh, that's magnificent. From Billy Vinopola. All his own work off the base of the Saracens scrum. And it's all about the power. Welcome along to Monday Night Rugby. We have Rory O'Connor from the Irish Independent here. We have Liam Toland with us as well. Saracens creating a dynasty of their own. Three and four years unbeaten in the pool stages. They put 56 points on Glasgow in the quarter final. They beat Munster by double scores. And in the final, 10 points to nil down. They beat Leinster by double scores. Liam Toland, that is as emphatic a European season as you could hope to see. Uh, I suppose the one statistic you've left out was a nine-dart finish, and uh, that's always a special way to win a, a European Cup when you go all the way through unbeaten. So on nine darts, which is it's it's in many ways, Joe, the game. Well, I said they were unbeaten in the pool stages, and then I felt it was implied they had won all the knockout <laughs> stages. But let's not be picky. <laughs> yeah, well, still, we counted up to nine, so it's, it's nine-dart uh, finish. Yeah, it's no, it's impressive. Burns. Leinster did it, uh, and now Saracens have done it. So. Saracens did it actually in 2016 as well. I think is their second time doing it. Which is phenomenal, and you, you like the, the fixture itself. Wasn't it a glorious end to all of that? All those statistics piled into that one fixture. I think it was just wonderful to watch. I, I enjoyed every moment of it, um, and much of it unfolded as we had predicted. Myself and Rory last week talking about the potential ins and outs. There was mm. like the power of Saracens. Uh, a couple of things that struck me though. Um, I know Brad Barrett gets huge credit for his tackle count of twenty eight. Mm. But that does beg a question. Why is an inside centre making such amount of tackles? And when you when you partner up the two centres, the Saracens midfield made 60 and the Leinster midfield made 36. And you could patch your way through where the contact was being made, where Saracens were making those hits. And then you add into that then the 18 kicks Leinster had mm. versus 14. I know throughout the season, I'm always bemoaning Munster's high kicking rate. I think this is a day where Leinster needed to move away from that type of contact and go to a kicking game. And I'm surprised that Leinster didn't go to a kicking game. And uh, the Saracens' defence, they were like the dominant tackle. They missed piles of tackles themselves. Mm. But you look where the actual hits were taking place. You look at Skelton, Cruz, Atoje, etc. They added up monumental amounts of hits. And they're all big, big men. And they... I think Leinster, in a way, were a little naive playing into that type of uh, trench warfare. Okay, because uh, Rory and the Independent today had some of the dominant collision stats, uh, Liam. And Saracens got over the game line with 48% of carries. Leinster made no progress or were driven backwards 88% of the time. You take someone like Sean O'Brien, he made 12 carries for a net gain of one yard which must be the only time in his life that will ever happen. When you talk about Brad Barrett and the Saracen centres making that many tackles, can you just tease that out a touch more and just um, you know, kind of dumb down that conclusion? What does that tell you about what Leinster did? Well, it just tells me that they, they went in with a game plan um, and when, when you keep one eye on what Ulster did uh, in the quarterfinals and you see what, how Ulster sweated on the second carrier, particularly when that was ring rows, both Ulster midfield defenders just went in and made the hits. Saracens are many times better than Ulster, yet within, went in with a very similar game plan. And, and Leinster, in carrying bravely, uh, and there was variety to their carries, that, of that there's no doubt, but the net result is they're running into monsters. And the monsters like Skelton, I thought, he was the player of the first 40 minutes himself from Farrell. I thought they were massive. And an awful lot of what Leinster did allowed those guys to dominate. Right. We call this were the dominant tackles. But when you think clean breaks, Leinster made two, Saracens made nine. So it would feed into the fact that Leinster kept on running into that. And I'm just amazed that Sexton didn't sit back and start finding grass, just getting a reprieve, putting the ball. Remember, possession, I think, was about 50-50, or yeah, territory was yeah. only 50-50. So in, in most of the stats, 
there was equ equilibrium. I'm just surprised that Leinster didn't go to a, a kicking game and, and employ that option more regularly yeah. just to just to get behind the Saracens and get a bit of reprieve. Yeah, fair point. Rory, not to draw too many parallels with the game at the Aviva against England, but there's a lot of similar players and the theme we've just um, kicked off on there is similar as well. Were we not saying the same thing about Ireland's kicking game after England? We were, um, and the failure to adapt is worrying because Leicester did kick three times in the first five minutes. Um, first one was locked down, second one they got the ball back from a contestable and the third one Jor uh, Jordan Armour kicked it against the legs and mm. they um, they kind of stopped after that uh, and, and there were times the, the St James' uh, Park um, press box is really tight to the pitch and you're really close to the action and um, it was just a completely different perspective for those of us working at the game and it just showed the amount of space Jordan Armour had in particular in that first half, he was screaming for the ball mm. and it if Ross Byrne was playing 10, and I'm, I'm not advocating that Ross Byrne should have been playing 10, but he would have probably cross-kicked to him at least once or twice just to, to have a go, see how that goes, because he does it's such a skill that he has. But Johnny Sexton is, is as good, at, maybe not as good as Ross Byrne as, as cross-kicking. He's one of the best cross-kickers out there. Mm. The variety, like Ireland were probably the best kicking team in, in the world in 2014, 2015 with Sexton at, at 10 and Murray at 9. And they moved away from that last year to great success, but I wonder did they need to bring back that little bit of variation because... When you're bring, you know, when the collisions like the Ireland were the dominant team last in in 2018, but for whatever reason, whether it's a World Cup, you kind of hope it's a World Cup training program that they're all going to peak and suddenly be powerful again in in, in, in September. But I'm you know uh, I'm a little bit worried that might not be the case. But whatever for whatever reason, England have the English players and you know throwing Will Skelton, Lamont Satelli, a few others. Vincent Cocker came off the bench and was outstanding on Saturday. Um, and if you're not getting over that gain line, mm. I don't understand why you keep trying it. Um, you know they weren't the forwards weren't pulling the ball back to that second wave as much. It was much. Sexton was very flat, whereas you know Owen Farrell was much more behind the line, picking and choosing his moments. Um, and yes, it was. And, and Ireland did put themselves in a position where they were still in the game at half time. But I, I, like Leinster had their chances and will leave this game with regrets. While it was comprehensive in the end, and the last twenty minutes definitely got away from them. Yeah. They never made. They, they they needed to make Saracens chase the game for longer, and they didn't. They let them in too easily. Um, they'll, that's the way they, they'll feel about it um, and they had their moments and if they'd taken those moments we might not have been talking about those dominant collisions because perhaps it's much harder to make those dominant collisions when you're chasing the game and Leinster yeah. probably would have been able to play for field position a bit more or would have felt they would have yeah, Liam, you sort of felt, I mean, uh, Rob Carney's break is kind of rare and wonderful, and you said they made two line breaks. We can all remember Rob Carney's break, I know, because it led to the try, but because it was so rare, and Saracens, by contrast, were making very easy yards, it felt at times right throughout this game. So Leinster were going to have to live off scraps a little bit. Two of the key moments which have been talked about, one, Gary Ringrose, during that eight, nine minutes, at the start of the second half, where he elected not to go wide. There's a general consensus, that's a mistake, feel free to disagree if you want. I'm more interested in the Luke McGrath decision to kick out before half time. It wasn't just Luke McGrath's decision. Johnny Sexton was clearly part of uh, that decision. Sexton was clear. We saw Billy Vunapola on the 22. We said, let's kick to him, try and get the ball back, get another score. Uh, every decision can be judged in hindsight. Judge it at the time. What did you think at the time? At the time when he was, when he was setting up to take the kick, I was asking, what is he doing this for? I could totally understand Leinster working a field position to get another three points. There's no issues with that. I'm surprised that Leinster elected to give away possession, though, because they could have held possession. Um, they could have kept forging back in. They could have they could have drifted into say uh, what many teams do, a Johnny Johnny Wilkinson mode. In other words, the clock is dead. Let's get into a drop goal position. It's mm. a freebie in many cases. If you get it, you don't. If if you don't get it, you kick it dead, and the game is over. And half time is over. Anyway, I'm just surprised. And I was saying that in real time, the box kick for me. I, I could fully understand them building into a drop goal position, but I don't understand why the box kick, because at best it's 50-50. And we have discovered over time with Saracens and England in particular have developed a methodology of flooding that channel. So that 50-50 is no longer that. I think, I don't know what the stats are all season, but they certainly have ebbed away hugely. Like Ireland and Leinster and Munster for that matter have got enormous 60-70% uh, of those back, which is beyond ridiculous. So I just think it was a little naive. I'm not so sure. Yes, hold possession and go into a, a field goal position, but I can't understand why the box kicked. I'm less critical of it. I, 
you know, I, I looked at my phone at half time and my WhatsApps were full of people saying what the hell was, was McGrath doing it. But when I listened to the way Sexton um, explained it and then I got the chance to talk to McGrath in the mix zone afterwards and he explained it. And their methodology, their mindset was we have to go out and attack these team, this team and we need more. And, and they would have felt they needed more than seven points going into the break. And there's a bravery to that that I, I admire. And I think there's an element of luck that went against him in that Rob Kearney got trapped on the wrong side of a ruck, having gone up to, uh, having tackled Binny Vinopola. I don't see Saracens going 70, uh, 70 80 m- metres to score. The penalty gave them the, the, the in into, into the game. There's an element of luck. I can understand the criticism. It's, 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 it's a one that we all, it, it's easy for us all to make, but I'd be way more critical of Ringrose for not giving that pass, which would have been the brave move. And I think McGrath, I understand his methodology for it. I think he understands why he's getting criticised for it right now. I'm sure as they review it, they'll look at it, and maybe next time he won't do it. But I can understand, f- from, like I like the idea of going out to attack Saracens. I think you have to beat them by being positive. I'm not, like they were in Saracens half, just barely, but they were in Saracens half at the time, getting all, all the ball off the pitch. Saracens could certainly spin that in, in their own way. And to be honest, the way they scored that try just before half time, the way once they got into the half and the, ac- the ac- accuracy of their execution mm. suggested that they were going to get there in the end anyway. Obviously, it's a key moment. He might not do it again next time, but I, I can definitely see the rationale. I can understand from, from listening to what he had to say why he did it. I l- understand less why Ringrose didn't give the pass, which I think was a bigger moment. Okay. Uh, Liam, your thoughts on Ringrose? And I am I'm somewhat hesitant to make too big a moment of the Ringrose decision. It's just Leinster almost needed to be perfect in these moments. But... Uh, what was it about the picture that you suspected Ringrose didn't like? Uh, maybe maybe he was concerned about the, the last defender of Saracens. I can't get into this guy's mind, but we had the benefit of a aerial view, didn't yeah. we? So we can see that much easier than he can see. So you gotta and you got to forgive players. They make a decision, sometimes the right and wrong. It wasn't the only overlap opportunity that Leinster created. Leinster created a number of overlap opportunities. And I suppose what... Playing against Saracens at this level tells us is that uh, players, regardless of number on the on their back, have to be able to understand a three v two or a four v three and be able to convert that. Our Southern Hemisphere cousins typically can convert those opportunities mm. and do so, like Australia do it ad nauseum. And I suppose that's the key message that, um, like my my key takeaway were those who were up. That's a fourteen point swing. You know, there's no two ways around it. Mm. Um, the Leinster's lineup. We talked about it last week. How I thought that Saracens would attack and prevent Leinster getting a lineup maul to gain yards and gain foothold and, and slow down the tempo. I think Leinster got a total of four meters gained from the from their maul because Saracens had a methodology. First of all, they didn't kick it to touch, and second of all, when when Leinster set up a maul, they reduced it. So the the opportunities for Leinster were very, very few. Hence, when one or two present, mm. you have to convert them. And that Ringrose one is the argument, but there were others as well. I'm, I'm in no way trying to hang Gary Ringrose out to dry. It might sound like that a little bit, but it's it, it, it's the it's the margin between the two brilliant teams that we saw on Saturday. And, and like, Ringrose is going to be Ireland's 13, if fit, is going to be Ireland's 13 in a World Cup quarterfinal, you you would presume, because he's good enough. And I'm not, like, no one's saying he should be dropped for this. No, of course. But w- in these games, these are the moments, and as you try and analyse the games, these are the moments where you win them. And do you and think, do you, do you genuinely think that the margins were that fine between these two teams? They were at that point, yeah. I, but but I even in broad let's, terms, I, say, say Ringrose uh, puts his man in and they go and they, you know, the quick, quick two passes and they score a try, do you still not think Saracens win that game? I, I probably would back Saracens to come back and win it, but I think Leinster would then ask them a question that they they haven't really been asked, and it forces them to chase the game a little bit. You know, Leinster were dominant for their first ten minutes after half time. Yeah, they, they you know they survived a bit in the first thirty minutes, even though they had their moments as well. I mean, they were ten 0 up. If they got into half time, if if they had it wasn't if, a reflection of the game though, ten 0 up. No, but it's the scoreboard. You I know, know, I like, appreciate that. I like, appreciate Sar- that. But then Saracens start getting frustrated. They start looking at their missed opportunities. You know, they, they start looking at the time it came, comes off Owen Farrell's chest, the, the couple of knock-ons. They can't commit Billy Vinopola into intercepting Johnny Sexton's pass all the time because they know they're onto a winner at that stage. Yeah. The scoreboard is Saracens' friend and if you let it be, and most teams do because they're so good. Mm. I, I don't think Leinster's bench was good enough to close out the game either, but I do think that if you are going to beat Saracens, and Leinster have shown in the last... eight. 12 months that they are, or 13 months that they are good enough to beat Saracens on their day when they're at their best and Saracens are a little bit off. Yeah. Um, and the only way you're going to find out is by taking your chances. And that's that's where that moment, I think, was key. And even 
a few minutes later when Ring Rose was, was being tackled by Liam Williams, he had a chance to offload the ball and he, and he held onto it and yes, he got turned yeah. over, which, you know, Jerome Garces might, might have given a penalty the other way, such is life. You know, these are the moments, and, and these are the moments that if Leinster want to be the best team in the world, they're going to have to get better. Like, their, their passing needs to be crisper, yeah. their decision-making needs to be quicker, because that's the level that, they, that, that they're trying to get at. That's where they expect to be. Yeah. Like, their, their headquarters is covered in pictures of living Europe, lifting European Cups. It's what they're all about. Yeah. It is everything they define themselves by, and that's what they'll be looking at in their, their review today. I mean, and, and Ringrose is really self-critical, self-analytical, and very honest. Mm. He'll be putting his hands up about that, I would presume. I mean, he hasn't spoken to the media yet. He will at some stage. Mm. I'm sure he'll, he'll address it in some way. You know, that's, that's, the, that's, that's the measure that they, they hold themselves to, and, and they'll be disappointed by that as well. Liam, am I wrong to think there was a big gap between these two sides, regardless of whether or not Ringrose and Leinster put that through the hands and score? Uh, of course there's a big gap because you're 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 looking at the two best teams in Europe. One is a an athletic, bruising, brilliant team, and the other team has made its way to this level primarily by being able to mix up their game. Uh, some days they use the lineup mall. I mention it all the time, yeah. anytime we're chatting about the value of that lineup mall. The scrum is something that we need to talk about as well, because the try that uh, uh Vinopola scored off the base. There are elements of the Leinster scrum at that point in time and how they defended it that certainly is worthy of talking about. Um, uh, but Leinster, all through the season, have been able to hold possession when they want to and they've been able to go to a kicking game when they want to. I'm just surprised that, although with 18 kicks, I'm surprised they didn't elect to have, very, have a much more stronger kicking game, a lot more variety to put different pressures on what Saracens are doing. And, and like everyone's given Brad Barrett huge praise, but he shouldn't be making 28 tackles. Yeah. Okay, fair he point. should not be making, you know, I, I don't know what the average for an inside centre at this level is, but he shouldn't be making, like, Henshaw made 13. They both carried about 40 metres each. Mm. So everything else is almost the same, except a, an enormous different tackle count. And that tells a story, and I'm not so sure why Leinster stuck to it. Mm. Our rugby coverage is with thanks to Vodafone, team of us, everyone in. Rory, you mentioned being there and being pitch side, so I'm sure you would echo Leo Cullen's thoughts when he spoke afterwards, where he was pretty much saying... Almost, almost like out loud to himself. These are big men. Like they're just a big bruising team, as Liam says there. Like in 2018, it felt like Ireland were bullying teams physically. I know Ireland are not Leinster, and Leinster are not Ireland. But if we're just talking about Irish rugby broadly for a second here in a World Cup year, like why suddenly do you feel? Like, why are Ireland on the wrong side of this? I know you mentioned maybe there's some uh, master SNC plan for the World Cup, but uh, I wouldn't be that confident just now. Like they, no. they do seem to be on the wrong side of. The physicality of the game just now. They do, and I, I think what Saracens and England both have is that kind of size that the French teams have, but they back it up with their fitness. And, and okay. they, um, Eddie Jones did talk about how he flogged his team during last year's Six Nations, and you wonder now, going back to it, and England weren't the only team that, that Ireland physically dominated last season, um, but you wonder whether there was a bit of truth in that, and that he's got it right this year, that, that they, they are in prime condition. Now, whether you want to be in prime condition in May and June, or you know, in, in, in at this time of year, is arguable. And, and you know, Scotland were able to hold their own against England eventually, you know, in, in that Six Nations game. So it was all is not lost. But I do think Dan Levy, I mentioned after the England game, I think he's a massive loss when it comes to the physical, uh, yeah. his physical gifts. I think the, the decline of Sean O'Brien is there for all to see. Um, I think. You know, we have players in Keane Healy, in Tyg Furlong, and James Ryan, and Scott Fardy, Jack Conan, who are able to, to, to mix it, but they've got to have replacements that can come on, and unfortunately, Leinster's replacements weren't able to add to the physicality yesterday. I mean, Leo Cullen talked about genetics, and he just came back to it in the end. And they, you know, Leinster do have a, a Polynesian player in their squad, and in, um, oh, in Joe Tamane, but he hasn't been good enough to get into their match day 23. He's, he's fit and available. He's the guy they brought in to replace Issa Nasiwa. Um, you know, he hasn't had any any impact really. So they need to get him primed for next season to have a real go. Um, I think Leinster's depth has been diminished, which moves away from maybe the, the power point. But it, you know, we talked about it as, as far back as October, losing the players they did and not replacing them. The fact that the RFU were actively encouraging some of their best young players to go to other provinces. You know, overall, when you're trying to compete with Saracens, that's not happening at Saracens. So these things are all feeding into it. And Leinster is still one of the top two teams in Europe. They're just not. They've, they've fallen. One place, sure. Um, but the physical places. thing is definitely a concern, and I, Ireland and Leinster are going to have to find another, a new way of playing yeah. because the other teams have found out the way of playing against them. So between now and September, October, Joe Schmidt, and I'm sure he's thinking about little else. Yeah. Um, because you know he knew, he knows more than most what happened in, in that, that in that tournament. Liam, your uh, any old theories welcome on the physicality stakes? 
Well, I suppose one of the things between Ireland and Leinster and, and certainly Munster is that if you're preparing to play against these three teams for all they've achieved, how would you prepare? And particularly if you've got the resources of the playing staff and the management that Saracens have, you know that you're going to have to make over 200 tackles a game. In some cases, it's nearly 300 tackles. You know if you're a front five player, you're going to make 20-odd, whatever else. That's the nature of playing against an Irish team. We understand that. So if you're playing as a team that have the ability to, to sustain that, have the fitness to sustain that and discipline to sustain that, then what's your go-to play? And that's probably what Rory is, is, is hinting at there is how do these teams need to evolve? And I have huge sympathy. I think maybe my tone is a little bit negative and it isn't because I agree, Rory, that this Leinster team deserve all the praise we can give them. So I, I'm not coming to this from a tone of negativity in many sense. I'm just a little bit disappointed at some of the style of tactics they played. But they deserve huge, huge credit. Mm. Um, how the game needs to evolve, and if you think with one eye on Ireland playing in the World Cup, mm. um, we have learned enough times now that if the opposition can sustain, can go into 240, 50 tackles in a match, then we might run into trouble how to break them down, mm. particularly the style of the tackles and, and what Leinster did there and the, the running into the it running into the corridor of power and being dominated um, is a bit of a concern. Um, you look at, say, the, the Vinopola try that was scored off the base of the scrum. At that stage, Barrington and Cock had been on the pitch for over half an hour. That's That front row substitution took place in 29 minutes or whatever it is. Uh, Jack McGrath had come on. It was a dead steady scrum for uh, for um, Saracens. Mm. Uh, Leinster couldn't shift it in any way, couldn't disrupt the pickup, so much so that Vinopola, normally when you're a, an open side defending that, like you really are concerned about what a, a ball player of his calibre is going to do, his right arm stayed connected to the scrum. So if you're looking up, you can't even see him detach. His big left paw just picked the ball up in one, and he got six full paces before anyone made contact. So just not being able to disrupt that platform at that point in time, not being able to put some pressure on number eight picking up is is a concern. And then I'd feel for Reese Rodock, but when he came around, there were six paces. He's an impossible man to stop at that stage. Yeah. You As an open side, you got to be right in the corner just as he's picking the ball up and meet him right there before he even takes one step. So there's an awful lot of things we can learn from Saracens, but we just don't have those animals, so we have to change our style or be able to change our style um, mid tournament, mid game, or certainly mid season. So that's going to be an interesting challenge for us all as we go through towards the World Cup. It sure will. Uh, get in touch on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and you could uh, win our Heineken Star comment and a signed rugby ball and some nice goodies at the end of the week. On um, you know the issue of uh, debt, Rory. I think um, Saracens or Elliot Daly's joining and Lawrence Delalio was saying he'll be on double the money he was on at Wasps. They've already been accused of or investigated for circumventing uh, the salary cap. So, I mean, they, they, they'll they find a way, one suspects, to keep on going. Leo Cullen was saying, look, we, the system is not broken. The way we do things is not broken. We ain't going to sign five world-class players. That's not how it works here. Uh, that said, looking at the Leinster depth by their own standards of recent years, that's going to have to come on a little bit. Yeah, well, they use 55 players this season. Um, many of them are young Irish players who've come through their academy. Um, many of those have come through St. Michael's College. And they uh, need those some of those players to step up very, very quickly. Um, they're losing Sean O'Brien, they're losing Jack McGrath, they may lose Rob Kearney yet, there's still no word on his contract. Um, they lose Noel Reid, who's a really valuable squad player, who's been very important for them in terms of building that pro 14 um, yeah. consistency this season, which gives them a chance if they beat Munster at the weekend to get top seeding again next year, which gives them a good path back. So it all starts again. And um, there is no sign of them going out to the market. It will help next year that Jemson Gibbs Park is Irish qualified, which means they can pick all three yeah. of the, the three players they can't pick right now. Because sorry to interrupt, brief aside, one of the few men who seemed to wangle away around the game line was James Lowe. Absolutely, and any time yeah. he was involved. And Fardy was really important as yeah. well. So that's yeah. that like there and Gibson Park is a guy that you definitely can bring on the bench and change your tempo against that Saracens. You know, he gets that wide pass going yeah. and he has a, a, a break threat. Like McGrath must have been also quite tired because he put in a huge amount of, of fatiguing tackles. Yeah. And the fact that they get three the three backs on the bench is is definitely a concern. You would hope with a pre-season under his belt, Tamani can, can contribute more. Connor Ryan's a year older. 
Scott Penny's a year older. Um, this, you're hearing great things about Ryan Baird, the, the young guy who made his debut. Ireland in the 20s this year made his debut at the end of the season. Apparently a bit of a James Ryan 2.0. Put him in alongside James, James Ryan or bring him off the bench alongside James Ryan. Suddenly you've got that dynamism again that you're living with the collisions. Andrew Porter was deemed not quite ready. Mm. I mean, he's a power athlete. If they can get a scrummaging right, he can live with it. He comes on for furlong. Suddenly you have that. You've got energy. There's definitely not reason... Like, Leinster are losing some senior senior players. Sexton's a year older. It's a World Cup year. Next year could be quite tricky. But their academy does produce an awful lot. They have good overseas players. They're bringing in an experienced scrum coach after the World Cup to replace John Fogarty. They're certainly from a continuity point of view in a much better place than say Munster um, and they can't go to the market and bring in a couple of South Sea Islanders as a, a French team will or a Saracens might do or go get Elliot Daly um, but they've even shown that by going after Munster's Craig Casey who said no but they're showing maybe they're going to be a bit more aggressive in trying to you know Look bully the Irish market yeah. a little bit so that uh, that's another interesting dynamic so they're not going to go away they're going to remain one of the elite teams in Europe as I say next year's going to be tricky Claremont are back I went to the Challenge Cup final on, on Friday night and um, they look like they're going to walk into the Champions Cup as contenders right away. But um, Leinster will, will remain competitive, um, even if next year is a little bit tricky. But they, they still have a lot to going for them. And, you know, Saracens will have, be affected by that World Cup as well. It's hard to back it up. Um, these two could be around for a while longer. Yeah, I would think so. Um, before you go, is there any... Um, so it seems Ron Nagara has been heavily linked now with La Rochelle. I'm yeah. sure we'll hear from him on the morning show in the next couple of days. Is there any further word as to what's going on at Munster? Uh, Hugh Farley had a piece in the Mail on Sunday yesterday where one Munster insider described the deals that Jones and Flannery were offered as um, yellow pack uh, deals. We're going back to our Tesco days there or <laughs> Quinsworth days. Uh, but basically they were certainly offers that you could refuse despite Munster saying everything has, done to, has been done to keep them. Uh, that's just one report. We don't fully know what's going on. What are you, what are you hearing here? Well, the, down there today, um, Johan van Grand, the media for the first time since, you know, um, spoke very passionately about it, uh, you know, said 100% that he wanted to keep them. Okay. Um, that he believes the PGB who handled this for him, um, Philip Quinn, the acting CEO on, on the Professional Games Board, uh, did everything they could to keep him. So he's I, I essentially refuting um, that idea, but... Um, it's you know it sounds like there's been there was a bit of disturbance in in the fact that it came out through the media that he he was looking for a senior attack coach that maybe Jones was put out by that and and Flannery's gone in in kind of um, almost uh, in support in, in support of you know that the, maybe they came they felt they came as a package they came as a team and if one of them was being undermined they both were and they they said that they'd be better off and Flannery's got other businesses going on maybe he doesn't need the rough and tumble of week in, week out, Pro 14 rugby every week, maybe, you know, I'm, I'm guessing a little bit there. So um, it's left him in a bit of a lurch. It's left, left him spending most of his time in his press conference talking about something else again, which is something they're never happy about, yeah. but it's completely inevitable. Um, and the only thing it, ha it does give him is an opportunity to build his own coaching staff in his own image, albeit at a time when he uh, he's going to be, you know, looking at, people potentially finishing the World Cup. He's looking at a market that's kind of all been sorted out for next season, so he's going to have to yeah. be a bit creative. But um, it's not a good look. It's quite chaotic. Um, you'd wonder what's been... Like the, the one point he did make is that 22 of his players have signed on for, for next season. They've bought into it. Um, you know, Ty Byrne had a year left in his contract to sign the new deal. Joey Carberry the same. Yeah. He's saying the players are happy. Um, but you'd wonder, having all, all committed to see more, uh, more instability and, and lack of continuity, how, how comfortable they're all feeling because if they lose again on Saturday, they basically have made no progress um, materially from last year for all to say they've, they've improved as a team. Yeah, if they do win on Saturday, then Leinster feeling pretty blue. Yeah. Uh, excuse the pun. Liam, I know you talked about this at length anyway, the Munster situation with Nathan last Wednesday and we're still sort of trying to pick through the details as to exactly why it happened or how it happened. Is it, is it genuinely important that there is um, a Munster like an indigenous coach involved in the setup, DNA, heritage, all of those kind of things, or is there no issue if Van Grand goes out and gets the best people and they all happen to be South African? Well, I suppose there's a couple of questions in there, Joe. The first is, it would appear to me, no matter what way you dress it up, that the two ex monster players were born and reared. Uh, I know Felix was a was an inductee later in his career. He went native. But, but the, yeah, for the, for, the, for the gravy. But uh, at the same time, they didn't want to stay. So whatever way you want to dress it up, they yeah, didn't okay. want to stay. Yeah. And, and that 
is not a good that is not a good thing when you got players of people and characters of that character the second thing is around the south african thing like the more the more we've watched munster and i think leinster are vulnerable this weekend primarily because the emotional roller coaster of last weekend to this weekend like you how do you estimate the damage that could be they're vulnerable mm. that all said south african rugby is not necessarily how uh, munster need to play their rugby and the more and more the weeks go by the more and more you see um a one out carrying uh, a bish bash bang type of rugby going on and i think it needs to evolve now whether south african personnel are the people to do that history would suggest no because you know erasmus isn't that type of coach and i don't think south africa are going to end up playing that type of rugby so um i would hope that a huge amount of the Munster character and DNA remains in situ because it is wonderful. It's it's a world club. Uh, that said, in order to get into semi-finals, we know they can get. We know Munster and Leinster, and indeed Ulster, can get into the playoffs. It's the last two games of the season that is catching them out. So Munster need to evolve, and I would hope that whatever coaching ticket comes into play would prioritise how to play a game that's ultimately going to prepare them for the next semi-final to get into. Okay, we'll leave it there. Liam, thanks as ever, appreciate it. And Roy nice. O'Connor from the Irish Independent. Thanks for coming in, Roy. Cheers, Joe. Monday Night Rugby on Off the Ball with Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. Team of us, everyone in.